My name is Jeremy, and I live in California. Back when I was in 6th grade, I had a close friend. Let's call him Devin. Devin was a super energetic kid, and we would always laugh, joke around, and play ball at recess. Those were some of the best days until Devin, well, ruined it all. While I had a strong, healthy childhood and a great relationship with my mom and sister, Devin was not as fortunate. His mom was extremely irresponsible. She would frequently expose him to drug use, abuse of boyfriends, and other horrific circumstances. Sometime in the month of May during the year this happened, Devin became prone to extreme anger. Every time I tried to approach him, he would always stare at me with the scariest look I had ever seen. One day, Devin never came back from recess. I was in the bathroom later in the day, and it sounded like some kid was laughing in the other stall, and there was lots of loud metallic tapping. I finished quickly and ran out of there. As I was heading back towards the kickball field, something big and hard suddenly hit me in the back of my head. I felt blood trickle down my neck. My vision became blurry, and I fell to the ground, unconscious. When I woke up, I found myself tied to a tree about 50 yards from the play area. My head had stopped bleeding, but was still pounding, and I looked around in a daze trying to figure out what happened and who had done this to me. I tried calling out, Hey, this isn't funny. My head really hurts. You need to let me go to the nurse's office. It's all your fault. You've always had the nice life I never did, and I'm going to fix that. The person who walked around from behind the tree to face me turned out to be none other than Devin. I stopped struggling and heaved a sigh of relief, realizing this had to be a bad joke. When I asked him to untie me, he bent over and smiled a deranged, sickly grin. He then proceeded to rant about how much he hated me and was jealous of my life, and how I had a mother who appreciated me and didn't treat me like an inconvenience. It was then... He pulled out a kitchen knife he stole from the cafeteria, and I looked on in pure terror as he licked the blade like some kind of fucking psycho. I began struggling with all my might to get free, but he had somehow gotten his hands on the climbing rope from the gym, and there was no way I was going to break free against it. He raised the knife and swung it down quickly, slashing my arm and nicking the rope. I began crying, which only seemed to make him more upset. He threatened that he would hurt me worse if I didn't shut up. I began kicking and thrashing my body weight around in terror, until the tear in the rope loosened enough for me to get free. I rushed Devin and pushed him down, and started running for the cafeteria screaming my teacher's name at the top of my lungs. As I was running for my life, I could hear Devin about 10 feet behind me, keeping pace with my sprinting. Fortunately, my teacher heard my cries, and she witnessed Devin chasing me into the gym. Once we were indoors around other people, I thought I would be safe, but he lunged at me and we hit the wood floor hard. My eyes widened and I suddenly felt time begin to crawl as he put his knee into my back and raised the knife again. In that moment, I thought I would never see my mom or my sister again, but suddenly Devin was grabbed from behind by the gym teacher and restrained. We were then surrounded by kids looking at us dumbfounded. The cut of my arm still bleeding all over the floor. I was taken to the nurse's office and questioned by the police, and Devin was eventually expelled. The school stuck the word about me being attacked from getting out, for fear of bad publicity. I learned from that day that you never truly know someone until you see the hatred in their eyes. I never saw Devin again, but I hope he got the help he needed. This story contains elements of sexual abuse. I'm a 20-year-old woman, and my story takes place when I was about 8 years old in elementary school. I am from Mesa, Arizona, and attended the same school from 1st to 6th grade. In the school I went to, it was a requirement to take music class every year. There was only one music teacher for every grade, and he had been teaching there for many years. He was a middle-aged man, heavy set with black and gray hair and a beard to match. I don't remember all the details of every situation that happened with him since it was about a decade ago, but I do remember some really weird and specific things about him. I remember he was very talented with many instruments and would often play some of them to impress the class. 
I also remember we had an activity we would do before class, where he would play music and would have everyone run, skip and hop around in a circle. He would go around and poke us while we ran around. He would do this thing if you were wearing shorts, a skirt, or ripped jeans with exposed knees. He would come up to you and tickle your knees and squeal. Naked knees, naked knees. <laughs> I always hated when he did that. He was my teacher every school year, and even though he always weirded me out, he never gave me that rapey pedo vibe. We had these little plastic recorders we would play sometimes in music class. It's like a small flute. The school provided white recorders for us, but I had my own black recorder at home. So being the unique kid I am, I brought mine in. My teacher was excited to see that I had my own, and even asked if he could see it. When he took it, he started to play on it. Quite skillfully, he handed it back to me, and I noticed it had his spit all over it. So I went to go clean it in the sink, but when I started to go over and wash it, he yelled at me and told me to leave it alone and to sit down. I emphasized that I wanted to clean it off, and again, he told me to leave it. So I refused to play my recorder, and he sent me to the office for not participating. A few years later in the sixth grade, I wanted to play the trumpet, so I decided to join band. And you can probably guess who the band teacher was. There were many occasions where he would pull up my shirt for me and tell me it was a little low cut for a young girl, or would touch my back, or again play my instrument and not want me to clean it afterwards. And if you play brass instruments, you know how gross that is. But I especially recall one incident that happened at band rehearsal. After the class ended, there were only a handful of students left, and a few parents left in the auditorium we practiced in. The teacher asked me to come with him into the music room to help him clean up, bring in chairs, instruments, etc. I brought some chairs into the room and helped put a few things away, but he then asked me if I could stay longer to help him clean up some more even though everything was pretty much done. I don't really remember anything after that. Nothing at all, actually. I always thought I said no because my parents were here or something, but I honestly don't remember what happened. For years after that, I know I had a lot of issues that young girls shouldn't have. I suddenly became addicted to watching porn on my computer. I would make my dolls have sex with each other. And I started going to therapy after my mom found my Ken doll with the crotch completely melted. I don't remember being molested or raped. But I have read that traumatic memories can sometimes be blocked out and completely forgotten. Fast forward several years later, I got the news that my old music teacher had been arrested for child molestation. A girl I knew from my old band class came forward and said he had molested her in the band room when being asked to help clean. After she spoke up, a few other people came out with more allegations against him as well. He was found guilty and sentenced to 15 years in prison. I have links for the articles about his arrest. The article says attempted molestation, but he was eventually convicted. Mr. Lamanika, I don't know what you may have done to me, but I hope I never see you again. The article mentioned in this story can be found in the description. Keep in mind that I am a female, and this took place when I was 21. This encounter still scares me to this day. I used to work at a subway, mostly during the night shift. And as some people know, some pretty interesting things are known to happen during the night shift. This particular shift was most definitely the worst. I was working alone during the closing shift one night. This old man who looked to be about 80 years old comes in and starts asking for a meatball sub, but asks in a very heavy Swedish dialect. So obviously I couldn't understand him very well. The language barrier seemed to irritate him, and he attempted to teach me a bit of Swedish for the sake of the order. I tolerated the short lesson and made small talk with him, as it's part of my job, and he pays for a sandwich and leaves. Nothing too bad, right? Huh. <laughs> Wrong. He starts coming in every single night, even on nights that I didn't work, and would always ask for me. If I wasn't there, 
He would try to get my coworkers to give him my work schedule and would only ever permit me to make his sandwiches. He would ask my coworkers to text me whenever he felt like telling me at any given moment. They would act like they were doing it, but what they were actually doing was texting me that he was there and that they were getting pretty creeped out. Luckily for me, it was against Subway's policy to hand out people's work schedules or personal info. The instances where I actually was there, he would come in and get the same thing, but started telling me things like how pretty I was, and how if I was just a few years older, I would be his type. He would then proceed to share with me what he did to himself at home, while thinking of me, and the weird things he would do to his sandwich. These miserable attempts at flirting with me would continue for hours, even if I had other customers. Remember, this guy looked like he was over 80 years old. I told my manager about the situation, and she wasn't much help at all. She would just check the camera from her phone every couple of hours while she sat at home to make sure he wasn't bothering other customers, I guess. I eventually went to my area supervisor, and he said if this guy showed up again, I was to call the police. The following night he comes back in, but unfortunately I couldn't get to a phone. He had a crazed look in his eyes, and I was afraid of what might happen if I tried to do anything with him in front of me. So I just made his sandwich and told him that I had other things to do, and he had to leave so I can attend to my duties. He then thankfully left. I told my area supervisor again what happened, and he banned this man from the store. The next week, he comes by right as I'm locking up, and I struggle to hurry with the gate as he's talking to me. At this point, I'm visibly shaking, and I'm hoping he doesn't touch me as he was inches away from my face. He was so close to me that I swear I could smell what he ate the day before. I proceeded to tell him, You have to leave me alone, sir. You've been banned from the store. If you don't leave, I'm gonna have to call the cops. He glares at me and says, I see what kind of fucking person you are. You're just a fucking bitch, just like everyone else around here. I thought you were different. By this time, I had fastened the lock shut and started walking away when he shouts, Oh, by the way, once you're done calling the police, why don't you go ahead and fucking kill yourself? I ran to the car and called my mom and fiancé and told them what happened. After that, my fiancé walked me to and from my car and sat in the restaurant with me every night. I also started carrying a taser, a pocket knife, and pepper spray to protect myself at work. I won't go anywhere by myself anymore, and anytime I see someone that looks like him, I start to freak out and cry. About three months later, I left that job. I was too scared to be left alone anymore. I later found out that not only had he stalked me, but the female workers at Walmart as well. He would find out where their cars were parked and leave things he found in the garbage as gifts, along with creepy ass love notes. I also found out that he would hop from subway to subway and do this to whatever female worker he chose. I hope I never see him again. Back in 1984, when I was practically still a baby, my parents were having a rough time making ends meet, since my parents thought it would be a genius idea to have four kids with no savings to speak of. They couldn't afford an apartment, so we had to move into a local motel with weekly rates. We lived there for about a year. My dad was the only one working, and my older sister was in second grade at the time, so my mom was stuck tending three children under the age of four for most of the day on her own. I don't remember living there since I was so young, but I was told about the place more once I started growing up, which I assume was a reminder of how far we had come as a family. One morning when dad was getting ready for work and mom got my older sister ready for school, mom noticed a shadow of a man against the pulled curtains of the bedroom. My mom is a notorious scaredy cat so she hustled my sister toward the bathroom, where my dad was, then hissed, There's someone outside the window. My dad just kind of rolled his eyes at her, but looked out toward the front anyway, to see if he could see anything. When he saw the shadow, 
His attitude changed. He snuck quietly, but quickly across the room, and opened the door. The man who had been standing outside the window immediately turned and ran off away from the motel, into the street blindly. My dad narrowed his eyes at this retreating man, and then closed the door, figuring if the guy was violent he would have started some shit instead of running away. He advised mom to keep the curtains closed over the window, and to stay home with the door locked until he got back later. Mom didn't want my dad to leave, but dad reminded her that he had to, or else he wouldn't get paid for the day. So mom reluctantly agreed, and sent dad and sister on their way. Later that afternoon, I was being an annoying little crybaby. So mom instructed my older brother to play quietly with my younger sister and watch Sesame Street a while, while she tried to soothe me into a nap on the couch. My mom was sitting on the couch, patting my back, while I bawled my eyes out for no reason. When she glanced at the front window to see if there was anyone there. Sure enough, there was. My mother freaked out, snatching me up from the couch, which caused me to cry even harder than I already was. She locked the three of us in the bathroom, so she could call dad at work, and then locked herself in with us. My dad skipped out of work and ran back home. When he got there, the guy was still standing at our window, with his hands cupped around his face, like he was trying to get a better look through the gap in the curtains. But my dad didn't even give the guy a warning. He just punched him in the head as soon as he got close enough. The guy stumbled away from the window in a daze, and dad slapped him around, all the while yelling things like, You think it's okay to scare people? You think it's okay to scare my wife and my kids? I'll show you what happens to fuckers who creep around windows. My dad hit him a few more times, before the motel manager showed up and stopped him, thinking my dad was just beating up some random guy. The window creeper got away during the confusion, and he never came back. This story is told from the perspective of a female. I'm 33 years old, but this story took place when I was 18. I had this friend named Javier who lived across the street from my apartment building. We hung out a lot, and through him I met a guy named Jake. At first he came off as very charming, and we began dating. But after a short while I realized his sweet attitude was just a facade, and that he was a bit of a pothead. He also became violently jealous if he thought other guys were looking at me, and even told me that I wasn't allowed to go to the club because he didn't want guys hitting on me. Eventually, he started harassing me for money to buy pot. He had never laid a hand on me until one day when he demanded money from me, and I refused. Usually, he would just whine like a little bratty child for hours until I relented and gave him cash to shut him up. But this time he decided to slam my head against the air conditioner in his room. I shoved him off and walked past him and out of his apartment, telling him that we were through. I was secretly relieved he had given me a reason to finally end it, because now I could go hang out at the club again with my friends. Skip ahead to that weekend, and I'm at the club. Jake shows up to harass me about breaking up with him. The bouncer noticed him and threw him out, after Jake made a pitiful attempt to fight back. Every weekend after that, he tried getting back into the club, but was never allowed in. I heard through a male friend of mine that he was spreading rumors that I had an STD, and also asked a guy that I knew to hack into my computer and plant a virus. Then one weekend, this guy that I didn't know came up to me in the club and told me that Jake had given him a knife outside and told him to go inside and stab me because nobody leaves him. I should have called the cops, but I didn't, mostly because I was young and foolish and was determined not to be intimidated by him. I made sure my male friends would walk or drive me home and watch my back. Skip ahead a few months and Jake disappears. Just like that, I stopped being harassed by him with no explanation and I'm thrilled. I eventually hear through my friend Javier that he has been arrested. Apparently he and his friend have beaten a guy into a coma with a skateboard. Skip ahead 10 years later, 
I get a message on Facebook from him telling me that he's out of prison and asked me to get back together with him. He sees that I'm now married with kids, but regardless says that I should leave my husband to be with him, that he would take care of me and my kids. I thought, you think I would leave my husband for a crazy convict stalker? He tells me how his mother died and left him a place in Manhattan and that I should come live with him. And then without pausing to breathe, he asked me for nudes. Then I immediately blocked him. About two years later, my good friend Javier went missing in the Bronx. After leaving his brother's house, a few weeks later they found his body in the river. As far as I know, they never found out who killed him. Jake may have had nothing to do with it, but he's the only violent person I knew that Javier hung out with. Sadly, Javier left a daughter behind, who now has no dad. As far as I know, Jake is still wandering the streets of New York City. I've attached a link to a New York Post article reporting about the skateboard attack. I'm going to start this by saying I'm a pretty big nerd when it comes to anime. So naturally, I love attending conventions while cosplaying. My husband and I had recently attended an anime convention, but unfortunately my experience was ruined when I encountered someone I had hoped to never see again. Thank God he didn't recognize me. But regardless, it brought back an awful memory I had managed to bury deep within my subconscious. I'm a 22-year-old female, but at the time of this chilling event, I was 15. And my friends and I were attending our very first convention. It was smaller than average, I suppose, but we didn't mind. We were just happy to take part in the experience. And while we met some great people, there was one person I had a confrontation with that will forever be burned into my memory. We decided on the first day of the convention to make sure and coordinate our cosplay outfits. We decided to dress up as Vocaloids, which are a group of anime hipster characters based of different tech software companies. No joke, Google them. So we were there exploring, taking pictures, and having a good time when we see someone dressed as a fellow Vocaloid, thinking, what are the chances? We decided to ask him if he would mind taking some pictures with us. He agreed with a good-natured smile, and we had someone take a few group pictures of us all together. Afterwards, we made some small talk with him, and he introduced himself as Patrick, and that he would introduce us to some other cosplay enthusiasts. We agreed because why not? That was kind of in the spirit of why we were all there. We met up with Patrick's friends shortly after, and they informed us that there would be a party in their hotel room later on, and that we were all invited. We reluctantly explained to them that we were underage. Patrick's friends then apologized for the misunderstanding, and told us that we would see them around the convention, and to have fun and stay safe. It seemed like they had a hard time convincing Patrick to leave with them, as he seemed to want to linger and talk to us but eventually he begrudgingly made to leave our group and join his friends at their insistence. We told him goodbye, and that we would probably catch up with him tomorrow. It was getting late anyway, and what panels were still open were strictly 18 and older audiences. Patrick shrugged. Well, it's not like any of you haven't seen Hantai before, so having an age limit is pretty much bullshit. He offered to buy us Hantai books from the vendors if we decided we wanted some. We all were more embarrassed than flattered. He had a point, given that we all had experienced hentai graphic novels at some point. We told him goodnight, and we went back to our room without really fixating much on him. The next day we got an early start, and dressed up in different cosplay outfits. I decided to dress up as Lolita for the day. We bumped into Patrick downstairs, and he injected himself into our group again. We all were having such a good time, that it took me a while to realize that he was constantly staring right at me, and not in a shy, subtle way either. Thinking that the bow of my outfit was crooked, or my contacts were messed up, and I asked him if something was wrong with how I looked, he replied almost too quickly, No, I guess I forgot to mention to you ladies that I'm a Lolicon fan, and you just look really cute. I felt myself blush and wondered just how hard of a Lolicon fan he was, 
or was he the type that looks at Lolita-themed porn? I eventually tried to brush off his statement and have some fun. After a short while, we made our way down to the vendors, and I ended up getting separated from my friends and found myself alone with Patrick. Suddenly feeling very vulnerable, I pulled out my phone to call my friends so we could regroup when I realized my phone is dead. Swallowing my pride, I reluctantly asked him if I could borrow his. He told me his phone was up in his hotel room, and if I didn't mind, we could go up there together and get it. I replied I would just go back to my own room and plug in my phone instead. He seemed kind of irritated by my apprehension, and insisted that it would be quicker just to get the phone from his room. Being the dumb and trusting girl that I was at the time, I gave in, and we headed up to the room. On the way up, he started telling me about this hentai comic he read about an elementary school girl who lies to a lonely blind man about her age, telling him that she's in high school and willingly has sex with him, and they develop feelings for each other. I'm more than slightly creeped out by that, but it only got worse when he proceeded to tell me that he really got turned on by a certain scene involving the character I'm dressed up as in her comic and wouldn't it be great if I could reenact it for him? Before I could think of an excuse to separate myself from him, we were outside his room. I told him that I would wait outside while he grabbed his phone, but he insisted on me coming into the room. Because it would only be a minute, it was easier just to accept than to argue, so I went in and stood right next to the door. While he went over to his bag on the bed, and began digging around inside. While he was preoccupied, my eyes wandered around the room, trying to find anything I could use as a weapon, should I need one. I noticed a charger hanging out of a wall outlet, and I grabbed it. I figured I would lock myself in the bathroom, plug my phone in, and call for help. I told him that while he searched, I would use the restroom, and that I would be right back out. He then turned and looked at me, with the most sadistic look I had ever seen, and asked me if I would just rather use him as a toilet instead. Without thinking twice, I sprinted out of there and back to my own hotel room. When I reached the room, my friends were already there waiting for me. They figured that my phone had died and that I would make my way back to charge it. I explained to them what happened and told them to avoid Patrick at all costs. We hung out in our room for a while to calm down and avoid bumping into Patrick for as long as possible. We eventually left the room a few hours later, sticking together as a tight-knit group, and eventually encountered Patrick's group of friends from the day before. When they asked us if we had seen Patrick recently, we lied and told them no. One of the women in the group informed us that we should steer clear of him because he seemed to have an unhealthy interest in young girls. We asked them why they were at the convention with him if he gave off bad vibes. They told us that they had been friends with him for a while and liked to keep an eye on him as best they could to prevent him from trying anything, but he would occasionally slip away. Out of sheer embarrassment, I didn't say anything to them about what happened. This guy Patrick apparently still goes to conventions in my state. I know this because my husband and I had bumped into him last year. I was relieved when he either didn't recognize me or didn't approach me due to my husband being with me. Either way, Patrick, I hope you haven't successfully baited any other girls into your room. I've never shared this story with anyone outside my immediate family. It may sound insane, but I promise it's the absolute truth. When I was 15, my parents and I moved to a newly constructed housing development in Beltsville, Maryland. We lived right on the end of a cul-de-sac, but our house was the only one that was completed. Granted, our lawn was just one giant patch of dirt, but we didn't mind. We loved the experience of living in a brand new house in a quiet corner of the neighborhood. All of the other houses around us still needed the finishing touches put on, such as windows and siding, so none of them were occupied. During the day, there were contractors all over the other properties hard at work. But at night, it was nice and quiet, 
and my parents and I would take long walks around the area and sneak peeks at the inside of the other empty houses. About a week after we moved in, I woke up at around 2 a.m. from an awful pain in my foot that turned out to be an ingrowing toenail. But I didn't know that at the time. I limped downstairs trying to find my Game Boy because I figured if I was going to stay awake and miserable, I might as well play some Pokemon Blue to make the time pass. I didn't turn on any lights on my way downstairs, and I found the Game Boy on the coffee table by the light of the street lamps outside. I walked back past the front door to head back upstairs, when I noticed something out of the corner of my eye, and paused. Next to our front door, we had a long window that gave us a perfect view of our porch outside and the driveway beyond. My mom had intended to put up a curtain, but hadn't got around to it yet. I stopped in my tracks and turned to look outside, and after squinting for a few seconds, my heart began to hammer inside my chest, and I'm sure my eyes went as big as stop signs. In the dark, it was hard to tell for sure. The only light I had to judge by was the street lamp at the end of the driveway, but there looked to be a figure of a man standing with his back to me, literally just off our porch, as if he had just stepped off of it. He seemed to be staring in the direction of the empty house across the street. That was scary enough, but what terrified me even more was how dead still he was standing. He wasn't even shifting his weight or fidgeting in any way I could make out. I blinked hard and tried to tell myself I was just seeing things, that it was a shadow or just my imagination. But when I opened my eyes again, I realized I wasn't crazy. The figure was definitely there. I should have cautiously made my way back upstairs and woke up my parents, but instead I did something very stupid. I'm not sure why I did it. I guess some part of me just wanted to try to make out if he was breathing, and I moved closer to the window and practically pressed my face to the glass. That's when the figure either heard me or felt my eyes on him, and his head spun around to face me, not his upper body. Just his head jerking around to look over his shoulder, almost like an animal. In that moment, I saw two pale pinpricks of light staring directly back at me, and I just knew they were his eyes. I launched myself back from the window and screamed for my parents, I practically flew up the stairs and started wailing that there was a man on the front porch. My parents don't believe in guns, so when my dad saw the terror on my face, he grabbed the closest heavy object within reach, which happened to be a metal tubing attachment from the vacuum cleaner. He then made his way down the stairs. As I threw myself into my mom's arms, I heard my dad cursing and hollering. Then there was a moment of silence. We heard my dad drop the pipe and when he called upstairs to my mom, his voice was terrified and desperate. Call the cops. Do it now. Now, my dad is a big guy, 6'4", and at the time, easily 250. And back when I was a baby, he used to work part-time as a bouncer. But in that moment, he sounded frightened in a way I never thought possible. There came a hard pounding from outside the front door. I hid in my parents' closet while my mom called the cops. My dad was halfway up the stairs yelling at the guy just to leave, and that the police were coming. After what felt like 10 minutes, though it was probably closer to 3, the pounding stopped. The police arrived maybe 10 minutes later and searched the entire property and the surrounding houses, but they couldn't find the man. I stayed upstairs while my mom and dad spoke to the officers in the driveway. The police did routine drive-bys for the next several nights, but as far as I know, they never found the man. I didn't get a good night's sleep for weeks. I kept remembering how the man's head had snapped around to face me, those pale eyes burning themselves permanently into my mind. It was several weeks later that my dad finally told me what scared him so much. When he had reached the bottom of the stairs, the man had his face pressed up to the window, and the knife was between his teeth. My dad dropped the vacuum pipe when he saw the tip of the knife impaled through the man's cheek. The man had then started tracing his blood against the outside of the window with his finger. After the police had arrived, they noticed streaks of blood all around the siding of our house, as if he had encircled it, continuing to run his bloody fingers across the outer walls. My family never took walks at night again, even after the other houses were eventually occupied, and to this day, 
I never ever peek out through the curtains at night for fear I may see those eyes again. My story takes place in Lancaster, California back in 2007. I was 18 at the time and a senior in high school. I had picked up a job as a sign waver. You know, those people who stand outside on street corners waving promotional signs for businesses. Yeah, it sucks about as much as you think it does, but as a high school student it paid fairly well. By the way, please stop throwing things at us from your cars while we're waving our signs. It's just not cool. The job is demeaning enough without having fast food launched at our heads. Anyway, I had been standing on my corner for about two hours swinging my sign around and waving at passing drivers when I noticed this bald guy sitting across the street from me on a bench looking my way. I waved to him more or less just to keep my rhythm going and he immediately gave me the finger. It wasn't just a casual flip off either. He raised his fist like he wanted to hit me and started shouting at me from across the intersection. I couldn't make out exactly what he was saying, but the word faggot was definitely used at least once. I avoided eye contact with him and focused my attention on the cars again. Soon after, my boss pulled up to the curb and told me that I was free to leave as our company got laid off and all the sign waivers were going to be replaced by a different team. I was disappointed that I would be out of work for the foreseeable future, but in that moment I was relieved to be able to sit down somewhere out of the sun. I was about to tell my boss about the bald guy when I noticed that the bench across the street was empty. I'm not sure when he had left, but I simply shrugged it off and got into the car with my boss, who told me that my replacement was going to be there within an hour. Over the course of the next hour, I went home, got changed, and was meeting a friend for lunch before going to see a movie, when the notifications on my phone started exploding nonstop, with people asking me if I was alright and to please call them. I was confused and immediately called my mom who started crying when she heard my voice. I went home to be with her and immediately found out what all the concern had been about. The news was reporting that a sign waiver had just been shot dead on the very corner I had been standing on less than an hour ago. When the victim had fallen, his sign had partially covered his face and he hadn't had any identification on him. So most of my friends had jumped to the horrible conclusion that it was me lying there. The creepy thing was that the victim and I looked very similar. We were both Latino with short dark hair. We were about the same height and even had been wearing nearly identical outfits. I was eventually interviewed by the police and I mentioned the bald man who had been shouting angrily at me from across the street. But to the best of my knowledge they concluded that the shooting was gang related. Either way the situation shook me and I didn't feel safe or relaxed for a long while afterwards. I felt terrible that the other guy died, but at the same time, had my boss not come and picked me up when he did, who knows if it would have been me who was shot and killed. I have a wife and child now, and sometimes when I look at them, I think about how different everything could have been. I'm 17. I live in the city of Estonia in Europe. English is not my first language, so I apologize for any mistakes. It was 2 p.m., and I had just finished another boring school day. I had guitar lessons on Wednesday after school. I considered skipping the lesson and going back home, and lying to my parents that the teacher was sick and that there was no lesson today. But I decided to man up and just go to class anyway. That turned out to be a big mistake. I got to the entrance of the building, and I spotted a weird homeless guy wearing a red hooded jacket sitting cross-legged in a puddle in the middle of the parking lot. I stopped and stared at him for about a minute in confused fascination, but he didn't move once. It had rained the night before and there were dozens of small puddles scattered around the parked cars, but it looked like he had intentionally gone out of his way to find the largest one in the lot to occupy. There were a couple of other people giving him sideways glances as they entered the building but no one was saying anything. So I eventually just shrugged and made my way to my lesson. After two and a half hours of sitting in the classroom, I had completely forgotten about him. 
As I left the building, I noticed to my surprise, the man was still sitting there, and he hadn't moved a muscle. I was very creeped out, and I did something very stupid. I walked over to him, and once I got within 10 feet, I pulled out my phone, and like a smartass, I said, Hey man, don't move. I took a photo of him. I have since lost the photo because I had to change phones. After I took the picture, the guy made eye contact with me, and my heart skipped a beat. His head didn't move, just his eyes. The man's skin was extremely wrinkled and weather-beaten. His eyes were gray, and he had an incredibly long, unkept beard, and he smelled like he had been living in a heap of garbage. His looks added to the way he was behaving, and it sent a chill up my spine. It was like he wasn't even human. I immediately took off at a brisk walk towards the sidewalk, not letting myself look back. I crossed the street and stopped at the opposite crosswalk, waiting for the light to change, my guitar case feeling twice as heavy as it usually did. I glanced back towards the parking lot, and my heart sank. The puddle man had stood up and was walking directly towards me. His eyes were staring at me intensely, and he didn't even bother to look both ways before he started crossing the street. I immediately called out an apology to him in Estonian, and again in Russian, but his expression didn't change. It was then I noticed that his clothes were dripping wet from sitting in the puddle, but it wasn't just a trail of water he was leaving behind him. He was bleeding heavily from both hands, or possibly his wrists, it was hard to tell, and he was leaving dark red pools on the concrete as he continued to walk towards me. I immediately dashed across the crosswalk without waiting for the light to change. In retrospect, I'm actually pretty lucky I didn't get hit by a car. I started running as fast as I could down the sidewalk without looking back. I know I should have just probably called the cops, but I was panicking and holding on to my guitar case with both hands. I didn't want to free one of my hands to use my phone for fear that it might slow me down. Every so often, I would glance behind me and notice that the guy was still following me with long, determined strides. After about five minutes of running, lugging my guitar, I felt like I was going to collapse, but I still had another half mile to go before I reached my apartment building, and the puddle man was closing in on me. Knowing that I was going to regret it later, I dropped the case on the sidewalk and just sprinted forward down the dark street as fast as I could go. I didn't look back. Once I got to my building, I ran up the stairs, down the hall, and ducked into my apartment slamming the door behind me and locking it. I was gasping for air like I had nearly drowned, and my mother yelled at me from the kitchen for making so much noise. She asked me if I was okay, and I just nodded without responding. I don't know why I didn't tell her what happened, probably because she wouldn't have believed me and would have screamed at me for abandoning my guitar and would have made me go back to retrieve it. I simply told her that I left my guitar at school overnight, and locked myself in my room until I was finally able to relax. The following morning, I woke up at 6 to walk the dog and to get ready for school. This is the part I'm sure people are not going to believe, but I promise you it's the truth. When I opened my apartment door, I gasped and my legs nearly gave out beneath me. My guitar case was sitting just outside the door and had dried crusted blood all over the handle. That was terrifying enough, but what freaked me out even more was the outside doorknob was covered in dried blood as well. My guitar case doesn't have a tag or anything on it with my name or address. I have absolutely no idea how he found out where I lived. I immediately washed the blood off the knob and the handle, and I never told anyone, not the school, not the police, and definitely not my parents. I stopped going to my guitar lessons after that. I haven't seen the Puddle Man since, but sometimes I lie awake at night in fear, knowing that he knows where I live and that he's already tried to get in once. Thank God I locked the door that night. Four years ago, I was finally able to move to a big city, one I had wanted to live in all my life. I had just turned 23, had a well-paying job, and many of my friends already lived there. I rented out a shabby studio apartment and got myself a cat. I was absolutely in love with the city. For a while. It all started at a punk show in an unkept dive bar. 
penis doodles on the walls, sticker toilets, my natural habitat. I had been drinking heavily and got very sociable, made the rounds to greet my group of friends, got free birthday beers and had a great time. I stood right at the stage for most of the show because the band was genuinely amazing. It took me a while to notice the tall skinhead guy standing about 5 feet from me. He was very tall, not fat or skinny, maybe broad is the right word. He had a shaven head, boots and braces and all that. I didn't pay much attention to him as I was focused on the band. During my cigarette breaks and while watching the band, I noticed he was always sort of nearby but I assumed he must be socializing with common friends. At one point I was standing in front of the stage, and a mosh pit had formed behind me. He was in it, and whenever he circled back around me, he would sort of shove me, attempting to get me in the pit, but I didn't join because I was wasted, and knew I would get hurt if I did. The show ended and everyone was saying their goodbyes, when I realized I lost my bus pass. It was too far to walk home, and none of my friends would let me crash at their place. I was in the middle of begging my friends for a ride or bus money, when the skinhead guy approached me saying that he could drive me home. He was clearly intoxicated, and I knew I shouldn't ride with a drunk driver, but so was I, and it was raining, and I never made the best decisions. While in the car I got my first good look at his face. He wasn't ugly, but it looked like he could pass for 35 or 40, he drove surprisingly well and got me home safe. At the apartments, he asked if he could hang out inside. I told him no, that my cat doesn't like strangers. He seemed fine with it and told me good night and left. Exactly one week later, I discovered flowers at my front door. There was no indication of who had sent them, but I hate flowers, so I threw them away. A few weeks later, he called me. Apparently, he got my number from a friend. He asked me if I wanted to go to dinner that weekend. I was really creeped out by this. I wasn't used to men hitting on me or being so direct. I declined, saying that I had to work that weekend, which wasn't true. That weekend, I went to a house show. There were no other skinheads attending this show, so I thought he wouldn't be there. But of course, he was. I avoided him for most of the night and tried having a good time. When I realized this guy had done nothing wrong to me, he had been nothing but nice and helpful, he just had a crush. So why was I being so cold to him and getting so creeped out? I decided to say hi to him and be friendly. He acted friendly back and we shared some whiskey and chatted. At one point he put his arm around my waist and people teased us for looking so sappy. Around 3am the party died down and everyone either left or passed out around the house. I was outside smoking on the front curb when he came out and bummed a smoke off me. He seemed kind of angry with me out of nowhere and started going off on me for lying about having to work that day and refusing dinner. He accused me of being a tease. His outburst was so sudden and unprovoked, he caught me off guard as he had been so nice just a while ago. I tried telling him I took the day off, but he didn't believe me. He asked me if I liked him. At this point, I started to realize how unhinged he was. I told him I did. Now keep in mind, I was drunk, and I said this attempting to avoid a physical confrontation. This was a terrible mistake. He grabbed my arm and started towards his car, saying that if I really liked him, I would come to his car and fuck him. I tried pulling away and yelled something like, you leave me the fuck alone. When I turned to go back inside, he grabbed the back of my hair and slammed me to the ground. My head hit the pavement really hard. I couldn't comprehend anything for a while. I remember him above me yelling, but I couldn't understand what he was saying. I only remember just lying there, not moving or saying anything or screaming. But apparently I had been screaming, loud enough to wake up most of the people in the house. They told me later that they ran out to see what all the commotion was about and saw me lying in the road screaming. He was beating up on me. I have no recollection of the beating. They chased after him but he got in his car and drove off. They took me to the hospital where I had to get five stitches on my head and had a broken nose. I was released two days later when they confirmed I didn't have a concussion. 
After my release, I learned more about this guy from my friends. Apparently, he had been telling people we hooked up that night he gave me a ride home, and led people to believe that we were seeing each other since then. His roommates told me that he would leave, claiming that he was hanging out at my place, and returned early the mornings after. He never did show up to my house, as far as I know, but possibly stalked the place at night. These same roommates of his assured me that they took care of him, and he jumped states before I was even released from the hospital. He hasn't tried contacting me again since. It took me months to heal physically, and I've become very paranoid and very untrusting towards nearly everyone. I lost many friends because of what happened, and a lot of people didn't believe me, except for the ones who helped me out that night, and the guy's roommates that ran him out of state. They've become very close friends with me, and helped me get through this ordeal. I don't live in the city anymore, and I really miss it sometimes, but I feel much safer in my small town. When I was a kid, my dad and I moved in with my grandparents for a while. My grandparents' house was very large and in the middle of nowhere. The entire house was built out of wood and sheetrock, so the outside was this dark wooden color, and so were the areas that hadn't been covered with sheetrock as a design quirk. Everything was always creaking as the house was very old, and every single decoration that my grandparents had looked like it belonged in a museum. My room was in the basement, which in this house wasn't completely below ground, so the windows in my bedroom faced out into the wide open backyard. Like I said, this house was in the middle of nowhere, so when it got dark, it got really dark. There were trees surrounding the house on all sides, as the driveway wasn't even a straight path. It curved through the surrounding forest before meeting the main road. I was home alone frequently, as my dad worked and my grandparents liked to go out. So without even having any pets in the house, when I was left alone, I was isolated. I was probably the only person around for miles. My bedroom in the basement happened to share a wall with the laundry room, but the laundry room was only accessible if you walked out of my room, up the stairs towards the front door, turned right, went down the second set of stairs, and walked down into another basement area that wasn't connected to my section of the basement. I know, it was a pretty weird design. That section of basement had a side door that opened up into the side of an attached shed. A lot of times when my dad came home, he forgot to lock the door behind him because it was kind of a door within a hall, really, if you count the shed. Anyway, despite the laundry room being literally right there, it was still a long walk from my bedroom. Whenever people would do laundry, I would hear them climbing up the creaky steps and slamming the door of the dryer, etc. One day, I was home alone after school, and I was sitting on the couch drawing. When I heard someone knock on the front door, I peered out the window to see someone standing there. Me being 15, I thought I was old enough to be an adult. I got up and went to go answer the door. The door had large glass windows on either side of it, so I could easily see who was outside. There was a man standing there. He was a Caucasian male, had a large beard with brown messy hair. He was dressed in a flannel shirt and overalls, and literally looked like a lumberjack. Thanks to the windows, I could see him as easily as he could see me. I was going to open the door, but then he stepped up to the window so quickly that I froze. I just stood there while he waited, almost like he was expecting something. It was then I decided not to open the door. Uh, hi, I called out hesitantly. Hey. He greeted me in a voice that was way too loud. Is Mary home? Mary was my grandmother's name, but most people who knew her well called her Mary Lou. I stared at him through the glass, not knowing what to say. I think I got her mail by accident. Could she come to the door so I can talk to her? They're not home, I replied stupidly. The man smiled. And they left a pretty young thing like you home alone? I didn't say anything for a moment and then pointed to the bench on the porch. If you want, you can leave the mail on the bench and I'll let them know you stopped by. The man stared back at me in dismay, but finally nodded. Okay, you have a good day. Later I found out it was only a piece of junk mail. I told my grandparents about the man when they got home 
and they told me they had no idea who it could have been. So a few weeks pass, and I had pretty much forgotten about the man. Aside from drawing, my hobby was polishing long branches that I found in the forest, and made staffs out of them. I would spend a lot of time in the woods listening to music and twirling the staves in my hands, and teaching myself how to toss them and catch them like batons. I got pretty good at it after a while. One day I was outside doing this when that same man approached me. He had crossed our backyard and walked right up to me. I had my headphones in so I didn't hear him coming. I nearly screamed when I turned around and saw him standing beside me, practically within arm's reach. He greeted me in a voice that was way too loud again, and reminded me that he was my neighbor and he had seen me from his section of the woods and wanted to ask me about my staff. I pretty much just shut down and refused to answer any of his questions with anything more than shrugs and grunts. What was really bothering me was that I knew there was no one within eyeshot that could have seen me that wasn't on our own property. The nearest house was several miles away. I made an excuse about having to go back inside, and I went through the shed entrance, which in hindsight was a really stupid thing to do. From back inside the house, I watched him saunter off into the woods. I didn't even feel bad for blowing him off. This guy had no business walking into our section of the woods and approaching a teenage girl. Several weeks later, I was home alone again, and I was drawing on my computer in my room when I heard the bottom two stairs creak from the other side of the wall, where the laundry room was. I froze, wondering who it possibly could be. I hadn't heard the front door open upstairs, and it was too early for my dad to be home. Starting to panic, I left my room and hid in the storage closet under my section of stairs. I used my phone as a light and crammed myself in between two boxes. I pressed myself down as far as I could. I was horrified to hear the laundry room steps continue to creak. Even though I was in the next room over, something in my gut told me it wasn't my dad because he wouldn't be climbing the stairs so slowly and carefully. I waited holding my breath as I could hear the ceiling above me creak. The footsteps slowed and then backtracked, as though the intruder was trying to figure out the strange layout of the house. Then I heard the stairs above me begin to creak. I panicked as I realized whoever it was had found their way into the section of basement where I was hiding. Suddenly I heard the footsteps quicken and the front door was opened and then shut. A few minutes later I heard my grandparents walk inside. The man had pretended to wait at the front door for them and my grandparents didn't even notice that the front door was unlocked. I cautiously got out of the storage area and stood at the base of the stairs, mostly hidden behind the corner, just peeking out to see what was going on. But he saw me. He waved and grinned at me like he was my friendly uncle. I did not wave back. He was acting friendly and confident, not at all like a man who was just almost caught for breaking and entering. We moved a short while later, and thankfully my grandparents have never heard from him since. I was in fifth grade when this happened. My brother is three years older than me, so he was in eighth grade at the time. I'm now 24 and he's 27. We lived on a dirt road in the middle of nowhere surrounded by trees, with my grandparents' house 30 feet across the yard. My dad's job used to require him to work 12-hour shifts. This incident happened when he was working from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. It was only me, my brother, and my mother at home. My grandparents were at their house across the yard as well. It was probably around 9 p.m., and we were sitting in the living room watching some TV before heading to bed. From the living room window, you can see my grandparents' house clearly, as well as the dirt road behind it, so you can see a car's headlights before you see the actual car. While watching TV, I happened to turn my head and notice headlights coming from down the road. As the car came into view, I noticed it began to slow down, I expected my fear to be alleviated when I saw the car continue to roll past the house, but it didn't. The headlights just barely managed to shine past the corner of the house, so I could tell that the car had come to a complete stop out front. I told my brother and my mother what I saw, and they came to the window to witness it themselves. My mom told us not to panic, 
It may just be somebody needing directions. Of course, I didn't think of this at the time, but what person drives down a dirt road needing directions at this time of night? We all waited at the window for what seemed like the longest few minutes of my life, and my imagination was going wild with horrible scenarios that my grandparents were possibly facing. Finally, the car came into view past my grandparents' house, and within a few seconds, it disappeared down the road. About a minute later, our house phone rang, and my mother picked up. It was my grandmother on the other end. She said that some truck had stopped in front of their house, and a shirtless man had knocked on their front door. My grandmother, who had answered the door, called my grandfather over to her and asked the man if they could do something for him. The man said that he needed my grandfather to give him a ride somewhere up the road. This request was extremely odd because there was someone else sitting in the driver's seat of the truck. My grandfather declined his request because of there already being somebody with the man, and he couldn't imagine why the man needed a ride specifically from him. There was a screen door separating them from the man, and after my grandfather declined his request, he became visibly angry and started yelling while beating on the steel part of the screen door. My grandparents closed the heavier wooden door in front of the man's face and watched him from the window until he got back in the truck and left. After my mother had gotten off the phone, she called my dad and explained everything to him. Being that he works a good hour and 10 minutes away, and the fact that nobody was threatened with a weapon, he just told my mom to call the cops and have them check out the woods around the houses. Just to be sure the man and his companion weren't trying to stake us out. We knew a cop that went to the same church as us. He came shortly after and brought another policeman with him. They drove both of their patrol cars up to the tree line and shined their huge spotlights into the woods. After he and the other cop had done a thorough sweep of the property, they reported that they found nothing suspicious and told us to call them if we heard anything else. After the cops left, my mom called my dad back and told him that everything seemed to be okay. However, the next morning, when my mom was taking me and my brother to school, we were driving in the opposite way which the truck had gone the night before. We hadn't even traveled a mile before we saw something strange. There was a black knit cap along with a shirt and a pair of pants and shoes lying on the side of the road, and they looked as if they had been taken off in a hurry. By the time we came home from school, the clothing was gone. Nothing ever showed up on the news, and the cops said they hadn't seen or heard anything about it either. It's been 15 years since that happened, and to this very day, I'm still left wondering what would have happened if my grandfather had agreed to give the shirtless man a lift to God knows where. This story is told from the point of view of a female. This memory of mine begins about three years ago when I graduated high school. I had grown up with my grandparents but decided to move to a different and much larger city to live with my dad for the first time in 12 years. I somewhat knew the city already because I spent my summers with him, but this would be the first time I would have the freedom of an adult to come and go as I pleased, drive my car anywhere, smoke cigarettes whenever I wanted, I was excited, though I was sad to leave all of my friends. As soon as I was settled in, my dad and stepmom sat me down to discuss a few rules and what I needed to know about the complex. Basic things like go wherever you want, but let us know when you leave and when you're coming back, even if it's 2 a.m. I had to park on the street because the apartment complex had limited parking and they told me to watch out for the neighborhood creep. His name was George, and he was well known to all the women in the complex, as well as the police that patrolled the area. He was tall and fairly huge. He looked very intimidating. My parents were pretty certain that he would leave me alone for one reason. My dad. Though George had a habit of stalking women in the complex, he would stop and find a new target if they had a man to make a show of being in their place. A brother, a lover, or a father. It didn't matter what the man was to the woman or what they looked like, George would back off immediately. Since I lived with my dad who was also quite tall and very intimidating, I felt confident that I would be alright. And for a time, I was. It started about six months after we moved in. My stepmom and my dad were fighting a lot and they eventually separated. 
One night I was sitting on the porch having a cigarette and browsing Facebook or whatever. I wish I could say that I felt like I was being watched, but I probably just ended up looking up when I felt a bug on me or something. George was standing about 15 feet away, a little bit behind a tree, staring intently at me. I nearly dropped my cigarette. Shakily, I stubbed it out and went inside. I was home alone, so I made sure to lock all my doors, and then I played video games in my room. I told myself that I was probably just being paranoid. The next morning, I got up for a cigarette and some coffee. Lo and behold, only a few minutes after I got onto the porch, George came ambling out of his apartment to look my way. I finished off my cigarette and went back inside. This pattern continued for a couple of weeks. It was like George stood at his sliding glass door peeking out, waiting to see when I would pop out. I told my dad about it, and he tried to sit with me whenever I would smoke. If my dad was with me, George wouldn't so much as peek his head out of his door. Of course, the other women in the complex have already tried to call the police about George, but he lives in the complex, and staring isn't a crime, so there wasn't much they could do. I didn't know how far George had taken it with other women before. With that info in my mind, I knew calling wouldn't be much use. Things slowly began to escalate. Once my stepmom left, I had access to her parking spot, so I had three ways to get from my car to my apartment, depending on how I parked. One of the ways went just past George's apartment, about five feet from his door. Since I got off late most nights, I avoided that route as much as possible. Slowly but surely, like he memorized my schedule, he would be on one of these paths when I was coming home. Not directly on the concrete, but a few feet away on the grass, behind a tree. It was like he thought I couldn't see him. Picture a child hiding very terribly behind a tree, and you can see about 90% of their body. That's how he would do it. I would rush past him, avoid eye contact, but prepare to scream if I heard him coming after me. I started to carry my keys between my fingertips. I bought a pocket knife and I would walk from my car with it halfway open already, even though I've never been in any kind of fight before in my life. It was around this time I believe my mother was trying to find me free self-defense classes since I couldn't afford anything with my tight budget. My dad was steadily getting more and more pissed off as George got closer and closer to escalating as the days went by. It went from November to May. If my dad wasn't home, I would lock my bedroom door and keep my knife under my pillow. I would Skype all night with my boyfriend just so someone would call 911 for me if need be. I put a bunch of flower pots in front of my bedroom window so no one could get in silently. I started sitting on the floor of my porch below the wall, so I would be out of sight when I smoked, but I would angle myself so I could see him if he walked up to it. Nightmares of me being kidnapped, raped, and murdered began to invade my dreams every night. One day, I was gossiping with my neighbor. Did you hear about George? No, what about him? He got arrested last night. In the parking lot of the complex, there's this big sort of electrical power box. It stands about waist height. It's perhaps maybe two or three feet wide. About ten minutes before I was supposed to come home and park right in front of it, some lady and her kid were walking by and saw George sitting on the box, masturbating. Was he waiting there for me? Jerking off to the thought of me seeing him? It kind of makes me want to puke, but also scares me at the same time. I was relieved for a few days of my stress, but it was only a few days that he was gone. Then he was back, and he went right back to the same old routine. One night, he got braver. It was about maybe 7 p.m. when I went out for a cigarette with my dad. A neighbor walked up to chat with my dad, and George came outside and stood out in the open, staring me down. Dude's asking to get his fucking ass kicked, my dad said under his breath. He went back to chatting with the neighbor. I rolled my eyes, went inside, and played some more video games. I was healing in a World of Warcraft dungeon when I heard my neighbor shouting, Where are you? But I was healing. It's a pretty important job. And I figured she was talking to someone else until she burst into my room in a panic. Her eyes were huge. 
She hopped from one foot to the other frantically, like she was doing some kind of dance. He's bleeding. Who? I asked in bewilderment. It's your dad. Come quick. I made some teenager huffing sound and left my computer, certainly pissing off the rest of my guild. I grabbed our little first aid kit and filled it with band-aids. I thought in my mind that dad was doing something stupid, like tossing up his knife and trying to catch it. But when I stepped outside, I found myself face to face with the real horror. About six people surrounded my dad, including my neighbor Shell, who was the one who came in and told me, and my neighbor Caleb, who was holding a shirt to my dad's side. My dad was facing away from me, and his entire back was covered in blood. It was like he had been mauled by a bear. That was seriously my first thought. I didn't know that we had bears in this city. Caleb's hold on the shirt slipped and blood sprayed. I feel kind of queasy writing this down. I have never in my life been the person to turn to in an emergency. Blood makes me lightheaded, and I have anxiety attacks over not being able to find a specific bookmark. But all the adults around me were panicked, aside from Caleb. I needed to be the person that people turned to. I threw the first aid kit onto the porch, and I told Shell where we keep our towels. She then rushed inside to go grab one. Has anyone called 911? I shouted. Five pairs of eyes turned around to look at me like they've never heard of 911 before. No! My dad shouted. I can't afford an ambulance. Shut up! I said. What happened? That fucker stabbed me! I dialed 911 and relayed our address and the reason for the emergency. The operator told us to keep applying pressure to the wound. My dad is a true champ, even though the sidewalk was just one big puddle of blood. He stayed on his feet until someone ran and got him a chair. I ran back and forth along the walkways to get the police and to show them what house George lived in, and then I ran back and forth to get the paramedics. They were so agonizingly slow. They walked calmly and I wanted to scream at them. Run! My dad is bleeding out and you don't care? I learned later that they don't run because if they let adrenaline kick in, mistakes can happen. They shoved Caleb out of the way because he refused to let go of my dad's wound. They got my dad packed into an ambulance. I was about to jump in when the police stopped me and told me that I had to stay so I could give a statement. My dad shouted at me to call his boss and I remembered all his algaes and whatnot for the paramedics. It's two years later and all these memories are still burned into my brain. I gave my statement to the police. Then they made me sit outside the complex on the sidewalk for about two to three hours. They kept me updated on my dad. Once I called his boss, my boss, and answered my stepmother's message, that's when I allowed myself to break down. It felt like I cried on forever. One of the cops was nice enough to go into my house and grab my cigarettes and a bottle of water for me. He stayed with me the entire time to make sure I didn't run off or something, but he was very nice. He offered to let me sit in his cruiser a few times to get me away from the cold. George was waiting in his apartment when they came. When they took him out to where I was, there were 14 cops. He still kept trying to stare at me. I stared right back and felt such hatred that I've never felt before in my life. I wanted to go over there and murder him. My babysitting cop looked over and saw George staring, so he used his flashlight to keep George from looking at me. Once it was all over, I was allowed to go back into my house, where I waited for information about my dad. I gathered the story from my neighbors while he was in the hospital for nine days. He shouted at George to leave his daughter alone, and George shouted back at him while I was in the house, Come tell me that to my face like a man. So my dad hopped over the porch and walked up to him. This creep had been waiting with a 12-inch blade held to the side of his leg. He struck out with his empty hand and then got my dad in the back with the knife. He missed his kidney very, very narrowly. The knife traveled up and punctured his lung and damaged his diaphragm. My dad didn't realize that he had been stabbed at first. He got George into a headlock and pummeled the shit out of him, thinking the dude had just punched him in the kidney. George dropped the knife, rolled in the grass, and picked up another knife he had been hiding, and stabbed my dad again, this time in the upper back. This wound was much more shallow, 
but still required stitches. At this point, Shell came outside and screamed to my dad that he was bleeding. He took off his shirt, got pissed, and threw it at George. At that point, the neighbor stalker put his hands up and went back into his apartment. The blood stayed on the pavement until about noon the next day, when one of my neighbors kindly washed it off for me. My dad spent more time in the hospital in critical condition than George spent being held in jail. I feel like it was my fault. I've been addressing that in therapy, but I still feel awful about what happened to my dad. Throughout the week while I was on the porch or just outside, I had so many women come up to me. They all told me to thank my dad for them. They had all been terrorized by George at some point, and they were now certain that he would be away for good. Several poor women had George stalk them up to their apartment door, and he would pull his pants down demanding sex. I can't believe the cops couldn't do anything. One of these days, one of my neighbors came up to me and told me that the police and neighbors had searched the complex and found that George had stashed many knives all over the place. Buried in gardens, stuck behind trees, under his doormat, I shudder to think that maybe one day he had planned to grab one of his targets and do something far more sinister than stare. George was declared guilty for battery with a deadly weapon, but the attempted murder charge was dropped. He was out of prison by Christmas on good behavior or whatever, but my dad and I have a lifelong restraining order against him. He has never tried to come after me, so I can only hope that he's terrified of my dad. I wish I could tell you guys that I took that self-defense course and learned how to fight like my dad, but I'm still a pussy who can't even slap a spider. So, there's that. My dad is doing okay now. He recently just had his third surgery to repair the damage done to him internally. We're hoping that this will be the last, and his quality of life will vastly improve. I probably owe my life to my dad. If he hadn't fought George for me, perhaps I would have been the first victim. George stabbed. For about seven years of my early 20s, I worked as support staff for a company that provided residential services to people with mental disabilities. It was a pretty cool job until this occurrence. The house I worked in was dedicated to the care of 14 to 18 year old boys. We often would receive different clients who would stay with us for any length of time, short term and some very long term. Jeffrey was a 15 year old autistic teenager. He was a great kid. I never had any problems working with him or any issues with his behavior. His parents simply weren't well equipped enough at home to provide the care he needed. His family, meaning his mother, father, and sister would come to visit just about every weekend, which was nice considering some parents dropped off their children and would never return. Jeffrey's sister was also disabled, but not as severely as her brother. We'll call her Sally. Sally was 20 years old, at least 230 pounds, and more often than not reeked of body odor. She wore dirty clothes, had long greasy hair, and had a face covered with acne and scars. Sally would always watch me whenever they visited. Not just watch me work, but would watch every move I made. She often tried to flirt, and it made me extremely uncomfortable, but I would usually just ignore it as she was a family member of one of our patients, and she wasn't really doing anything wrong. After a little over a year with us, Jeffrey was transferred to another residential house. After he had moved, he added me as a friend on Facebook. Due to the fact that we no longer shared a professional relationship, I added him back. Jeffrey began to message me no less than 20 times a day. I would reply occasionally. I figured perhaps he wasn't liking his new house, or maybe he just wanted to try and keep in contact. Most of his messages were simply, hey, hi, or what's up. After about a month or two, the messages picked up, at least two messages an hour, all hours of the day and night. After receiving a message stating, it's very fucking rude to ignore someone's messages and not reply, I deleted and blocked Jeffrey on Facebook not long after that. It had gone from being annoying to unnerving. Everything was pretty quiet and returned to normal for about a month. One night after work, I came home to my normal apartment. I made myself dinner, played some Xbox, and went to bed about 12.30. Around 9.30 a.m., there was a knock at my door. I checked, but there was nobody there. I figured they just knocked on the wrong door, 
as there were several people living in my apartment complex at the time. Somewhere around 3 in the morning, my dog started to growl and bark. I awoke to the sound of the large window in my living room shattering. I immediately turned the bedroom light on and dialed 911. To my surprise, the attempted intruder was caught by security. Surprisingly, the police showed up much quicker than I thought they would have. They assessed the damage and made sure that there was nobody in my apartment and that nothing was missing. Before they left, they brought me outside to see if I could identify the intruder. When I walked outside, a part of me was shocked. There she sat, Sally, handcuffed in the back of the squad car. I was able to identify her immediately. In the aftermath, the police discovered that she had apparently been planning this for a long time. She had gotten into Jeffrey's Facebook, which he had not been using for a long time. Every message was from her. She had been keeping several diaries and would write about me in fantasies. Her tone would often change from happy and loving to angry and disturbed. She would often write about ending my life. Listening in court to those diary entries was the most disturbing part of it all. She was convicted to six years in prison for breaking and entering, and due to her various diary entries, she was also charged with premeditated intent to commit assault with a deadly weapon. Last I heard, her family had moved far away, and I can't say that I blamed them. I eventually found a new place to live. I just wasn't comfortable there anymore. Tensions were high around our apartment complex when I was around the age of 10. In a month's time, we had a man that committed suicide, a partial fire in a building leading to reconstruction, and a child that had been hit by a car who later survived. Even at a younger age, I distinctly remember having a strong grasp on the bizarre events that were taking place. It had to be around spring of 97. My mom was single and raising me and my little sister, who was about five years old. She managed a different complex and would pick us up from school and drop us off at our apartment while she returned to work for a couple more hours. I have three older siblings who all moved out at this point. We had to keep an eye on each other at a young age. This wasn't really a new premise for me. There was no money for a sitter. The oldest just had to assume the role, which was me. For the most part, we were really quiet kids. We played with our toys, watched a little television, and sometimes played Sega or Nintendo. On this particular afternoon, I recall playing with my Star Wars figurine. While my little sister was doing whatever in the same living room, suddenly the doorknob started violently shaking. My heart dropped, and I remembered being the first time I felt such terror. I rushed to the phone and paged my mom, and then dialed 911 to let the operator know that someone was breaking in. The operator reassured me that help was on the way. The door handle was still being messed with, but I was nervous if the deadbolt and chain would be enough. A couple of loud bangs happened, as if someone was ramming our door with their shoulder, and then it just stopped. The cops arrived shortly before my mom, only to find a note from the maintenance man saying, Air filter check. Now the maintenance man claimed that he announced himself verbally, but I knew that was bullshit. Of course, the cops did nothing, and my mom's complaint to the office didn't result in this man being fired. Unfortunately, this wouldn't be the most unnerving part of the story. My mom said the guy would stare her down in the parking lot and just smile at her. The whole situation creeped us out, and we wanted to move, but we couldn't afford the expenses. One night, a couple of weeks later, I was awakened by a loud thud coming from the roof. I was rattled, and I ran to my mom's room to wake her up. She checked around to make sure everything was in place and assured me it was probably just a rodent. We went to school the next morning and we were dropped off at home in the afternoon as usual. Mom usually did a quick sweep of the place, even before the attempted break-in, but this time something seemed off. It was just a very uneasy feeling that came over us when we walked into our apartment. My sister and I were ordered to stay downstairs by the front door while she investigated upstairs. We waited patiently and felt very unnerved when suddenly our mother's shrieking confirmed our suspicions. She came barreling down the stairs and ushered us out of the door. We went to a neighbor's and phoned the police. My mother was barking at them. Someone is in our apartment. The police responded pretty quickly, and I was finally able to understand the situation. The bedroom had a walk-in closet that contained a hatch to the attic, 
It connected the entire building's AC and heat. There were shelves that were pretty high up lining the closet walls. My mother walked in to find a dirty pair of men's underwear lying on the floor. This was enough to send her running and phoning the police. However, the investigation revealed something more. The attic hatch had been disturbed. Just to add, the police found full handprints on the shelves in the closet. The noises I heard the previous night before were more than likely this man hoisting himself back up into the crawl space, using the shelves to climb on after visiting us. This man was taken into custody, but I don't recall what the sentencing was. We ended up moving to my grandfather's house shortly after. One summer, a friend and I took a trip to the U.S. We're both Irish guys in our early 20s. We took Greyhound buses and Amtrak from place to place. Since I'm the more organized one, I looked after booking our tickets and reservations. And when it came to staying in Chicago, I thought I struck gold by finding a room at the Hilton at a ridiculously affordable price. It seemed like a major upgrade to the dumps we had been staying in. But as we got off the 20-hour train journey from New Orleans, I realized I had made a terrible mistake. The hotel was in Addison, Illinois. Not the Chicago neighborhood of Addison where we had planned on staying. It was a blimp on the map that at the time consisted of little more than a road sign, a petrol station, a white castle, and our hotel. Luckily, the hotel offered a discount taxi service through a cab company that they were affiliated with and sent someone out to pick us up. This is where things took a turn. The guy shows up, pops the trunk, and just as we were putting our bags in, there was a roar from behind us. Hey, you can't take that cab. He has out-of-town plates. That's against the law. A burly cabbie was enraged by the fact that our driver had to pick us up right in front of a queue of cabs. I got about two words into my explanation when our driver lunged for the guy, screaming, You fucking bastard, I'll kill you. I have my iron pipe right here and I swear to God, I'll beat you until you fucking die. Looking back, this is where we should have brought things to a halt. But the truth is, we didn't have enough money for a normal cab to ride somewhere so far out of town. So being the two awkward Irish guys, we just got in the car, gazed in the opposite direction, and hoped that the matter would resolve itself. I'm not proud of that. After jumping back in the car, still cursing, the driver gunned it down the wrong side of the street at rush hour, evidently making up for lost time, while venting road rage in the direction of any honking horns. It seemed like he had been drinking, but bailing out of a car that was moving that fast genuinely seemed like a terrible idea. At some point between claiming that he should have been a race car driver and calling us pussies for wearing seatbelts, he told us a story about how he recently beat the shit out of a customer who didn't tip him enough. In my head, I tried to play this off as just a slightly unnerving, if not terribly effective way of ensuring a fat bonus. But the sight of my friend nervously counting a handful of sweat-soaked $1 bills gave me a sinking feeling. While I looked after booking reservations, he was responsible for things like taxi fares. Between us, we had enough cash to cover the trip before tip. This is where the implications escalated from vague threat to certain danger. The cab driver kept offering to show us his pipe, the same one he used to take care of the bad tipper. Despite our polite objections, he actually took the pipe out from under the seat, turning it around to wave it at us with a maniacal laugh while the car sped on. I couldn't tell which was scarier, the feeling that we were about to crash any minute or the looming confrontation when we would inevitably shortchange him. We were going so fast that the force of the wind coming through the open window took my breath away, intensifying this feeling of shock. Definitely the most distressing journey I've ever been on. Miraculously, the speeding had shaved valuable dollars off the total, leaving just enough for a small tip. We have been saved by the very excess that terrified us. I jumped out the moment we stopped, searching for help just in case things kicked off, but the driver seemed satisfied gave us his card and said to call him any time. He said he would be glad to drink whiskey and get into some fights with us. Hum, no thanks. Once we got to the safety of our hotel room, we just sat there, shaking, shell-shocked, trying to absorb what the fuck just happened. There's always
always a reason to be afraid.